Hi everyone, thank you Danny. So as Danny mentioned, we're going to talk today about our journey into data democratisation, I've managed to say it, um, with DBT. So let me take you on a journey. This is a random quote I found on the internet. Um, <laughs> data democratisation is the ability for information in a digital format to be accessible to the average end user. And the goal of this is to allow non-specialists to be able to gather and analyse data without requiring outside help. All well and good and makes perfect sense. So how did we start out on that journey? So back in the olden days when I was a lad, um, <laughs> we, um, the, the concept was um, self-serve data warehouses. So Cognos, business objects, analysis services. And the idea behind that was we are literally going to model the whole business in one database. Every question you could possibly answer will be in there and we'll be good to go and we'll never have to talk about this ever again. However, that did not work. <laughs> Why? It was slow. So the data warehouse was already out of date once it was delivered. It was rigid. And then um, in, in current times where we've got, we've got, app, we've got apps and more websites, they're, they're moving way too fast for that old style of, um, of database. And basically, you were, you were placing a big burden on your data and IT team. Um, and yeah, so it basically just fell apart. So next phase, what does that involve? The cloud. Well, <laughs> let's move to the cloud. So big, big data services, Redshift, Google Cloud, Azure, Snowflake, we're no longer constrained by physical servers. We can, we can basically land all of our data, we're gonna chuck it all in there and it's all gonna be brilliant. We're gonna get the web data, we're gonna bring from transactional systems, we're gonna get CRM data, and then we're just going to have it and then we're just going to write some queries and it's all going to be brilliant. But we know that's not the case. So the data marts were created um, in reporting tools. So you've got Looker, Tableau, uh, Power BI, and these are great for getting value from the data because you're able to get data into your database and then immediately start getting value from it. So you, you, can, you can actually get value very quickly, but this is not without problems. So, new approach, new problems. <laughs> Complexity has increased. Logic is created further downstream and in different places. Um, there's a lot of duplication. Um, so we've got many different applications here at Simply Business and we've ended up in a situation, even through knowing this could be a problem from the outset, where we've got SQL, SQL everywhere. Um, and this, this has led to discrepancies and a recent problem was where we're moving from being a UK only company to US so there were some changes we had to make to our systems to incorporate this which we weren't expecting and it was it was a very difficult process to to find all these little nuances of where this data was being stored and then also engineering resource becomes a bottleneck so if you wanted to to create um, streaming ETL or to to build more resilient systems to, to create this data then your engineers are going to be under pressure and also with the business changing so much, it's, it's gonna be a constant demand. <laughs> yes, I am. So <laughs> we've, um, we've all seen this, or many of you have seen this. So DBT is gonna give us a single source of truth, um, visibility of business logic, uh, complexity is visible to everyone. So this is, I'm really enjoying this. Um, if someone makes a comment that, oh, just DNA can just do that. I like to show them the, uh, the DAGs that we're producing uh, in, in DBT because they're, they're not simple. Um, it's version controlled, which again is a big, is a big thing. Um, being able to track changes as they're made, tested. Again, the problem with um, data being stored in various different places in Looker is you've got, no, you, you've got no ability to check whether it's bringing what you want and whether the results are correct. Um, so this, this is a big thing as well. And then people from across the business can contribute. It's just SQL. Um, I'm going to say everyone knows it. Um, I know they don't, but a lot of people know SQL. And we, in our team four years ago, it was declared illegal, but <laughs> that's not the case anymore. It's back, it's back with a vengeance. Um, so a little segue here. So I'm going to talk a little bit about our, our architecture and how that is allowing DBT to drive real value within the business. So a little buzzword, event-driven architecture. So event-driven architecture is a software architecture pattern um, promoting the production, detection, consumption of and reaction to events. 
and an event can be defined as a significant change in state. All well and good. And absolutely brilliant to us in the data team because we are receiving all of these events from all of our systems um, of that we can create um, business uh, objects on. So this is a slightly out of date diagram, but uh, <laughs> we've got um, our transactional applications. So we've got our Showpan, which is our back office system, CD, CMS, Idio phone, our Twilio contact center application, uh, full contact, um, contact strategy uh, application. I can't remember the phrase. Um, and the renewals, auto renewals platform. And then again, we've got our normal event collectors from, from the web journey. And these are all going through Kafka, and these are all being written into Redshift and at the moment, right into Snowflake as well, which will soon replace Redshift. And we've also got an application here. This is for just, it's kind of similar to Stitch or Fivetran, where we're just bringing data into the company. We, we wrote that ourselves a couple of years ago, but we, we may move to a, a Stitch soon. And then Looker, so that's sitting on top of, <coughs> top of our data lake. And <coughs> basically anything that's going on here is gonna be available to Looker. So that's, Really, really, really powerful stuff. Cool. So, the first the the first DBT model that we built um, was one for our contact center. So it was from um, our radio phone application, which I've just mentioned. So it was basically a lift and shift from a Spark, a PySpark um, application that was doing all this processing, and it was quite slow and it wasn't very agile. We couldn't really change it very easily, um, and we moved this. So it's fifty million events in total. Thirty different types of event, um, registering over 100,000 calls per week from the contact center, the last count, and empowering over 200 consultants in Northampton. And we take in those 30 different events, some 50 million of them, and able to translate that into four DBT models. So we're able to take all, all the complexity of that and bring it down into these, these tables that are understood by the people in the business, in the contact center, and um, the, you, they're able to be to be edited quite quickly by our by our analysts out, out in Northampton. So the model it's an incremental model. It's running every half hour. Um, as I said, it's 200 consultants. The product teams are able to to edit this data and create it in a in a timely fashion with pull requests and CI/CD. And the output of these databases, these data sets, sorry, is available for consumption by other systems. So this data is also driving uh, some, some ML for lead scoring and customer contact strategy. And the data is becoming, from DBT, is becoming an input and not just an output. As I alluded to earlier, one of the big benefits that we're seeing from this at the moment is being able to, to document all of our code, um, all of our models, because we, we're creating a lot of them at the moment. So being able to show people, that there's a focal point where people can go. So as an example, if we have someone new in the US, someone new, they don't know anything at that moment, where do we direct these people so they can learn about what, what these things are and how we're creating them? I think this is just absolutely brilliant for that. And it avoids data being described as a black box. So it can be seen as a, we're just taking a lot of data and then magically at the other end pops like a, some, uh, some a data warehouse, some KPIs, but no, we're able to bring people along on that journey and show them how we're creating it and, and, and let them own, this, own these um, models as well. And another thing it's allowing us to do is it's aligning analytics with tech. So one of our, this is for the CTO, but he's not here. Um, one, one of the, uh, the, the tech principles is to uh, data chain the coordinate version and propose everything. So the, the fact that we're bringing analytics into that fold where it's not just people writing the same query over and over again, we're able to get it saved down and get it version controlled is, is, is a really big thing. And also allowing data sets to be owned by product and business areas. So as we're scaling quite, rapidly, we've got product teams spinning up all over the place. And we in the data team cannot be owning all of that business knowledge because we're just not able to, to process all of that. So we want to empower people out in the business to be able to, 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 to work very close with an analyst, but also to create this without any real um, input from the engineers. And we can guarantee that it's going to be available, tested 
and delivered on a schedule, which is very useful. So back to the original slide. So I've changed it slightly. So we're now saying that data democratization in this form allows data to be created and owned by the end user. So we're actually pushing the data, which is empowering the business to the people out there. We're not just a central data repository. We're actually allowing people out in the business to create things that they, that they need to get the job done. And we believe that this DBT is going to be absolutely massive for us over the next few years. Thank you. Cool. Thank you very much, James. Um, we're going to take a quick five minute break. Let everyone go grab another drink. Everyone on the Zoom call, go grab a beer. It's like